Testing, one, two, three, four. Is that on my screen? Are you going to... Um,
Good morning, Tremont family and all of those who are joining us by Facebook Live this morning. Well, things are a little bit different around here for sure. You're not here, but I'm so thankful that you're joining us this morning for worship. Stay with us for some wonderful singing by our praise team, and I'll be bringing the message in just a few moments. Again, thank you for joining us this morning, and let us think about Psalms 34 and verse 3 as it proclaims, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Tremont family. Thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. We're so glad to have you with us and although you're not in the building with us and how strange it sure does seem to be here and you're there, but we welcome you right there in your home or wherever you might be today and um, shoot us a selfie or maybe a text to let us know that you're watching this morning. We have quite a number of people that we've noticed that are watching on Facebook today. So we welcome you, sit back, enjoy, relax right there in your home or in your car, or wherever you might be, and uh, just enjoy the presence of the Lord together with us. What we're gonna do this morning first is like we always do, we read our scripture together and we have prayer together. And today we're going to Psalm chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles there in front of you, I want you to read it out loud right where you are as we're reading it here and uh, let's just unite ourselves in faith this morning, believing God is everywhere at the same time. He's taking care of us. He's making provision for us. And he is going to bless us today. In the midst of all that we're facing in our nation and around this world, God is still on the throne and he's still alive and well. So let's read together from Psalm chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. 
and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices, Selah. May he grant you according to his heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, and may the King answer us when we call. And the church said, Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We have a number of very special requests. We want to pray specifically today and, and with all of our heart for the Aiken and Swafford family, also for Kathy Watts and her family today, and we want to remember um, Robert Rice's family today as well, and Sister Azalea, that God would bless all three of these families who have lo lost loved ones in the last few days. Two funeral services yesterday. Uh, Brother Rice's uh, service will be tomorrow, and they are private, or it will be private, uh, because of the restrictions that have been placed upon us. We also remember Brother Siegel Chafin today, who uh, fell, I think, off of a ladder and uh, missed a step, maybe, and has hurt his ankle, so let's remember him this morning. Bridget Myers had surgery this week. Let's continue to pray for her. Michael Crane also had surgery this week. Let's remember him in our prayers as he recovers. Then Russ Saulnier is now in NHC over in Greer. Let's remember him as well as Sister Vivian. And we want to pray for James Fuller today. Continue to pray that God will strengthen him and bless him and bring a special healing upon his body. And uh, then Sister Carolyn as well. She hasn't felt well this week. Then me, uh, Dean McCurry needs our prayers today, not feeling well. And Reverend Bobby Duncan, this is Brother Eddie's father, is home. So let's remember him as he recovers as well. Then I received word that uh, little Sarah, this is Vanetta and Grady Seagray's niece, has contracted the virus and is in Memorial Hospital today. So let's remember her that God would strengthen and bring healing to this little body. And so many of those who have contracted this uh, terrible virus that is going around our nation and world, especially this morning, a number of churches who have been affected by this, some in our state, others in other states, but there are several who have really been affected. I want us to remember all of these churches in our prayer today that God would touch them in a very special way. Let's remember our president. Let's remember our nation. Let's remember our leaders today. And let's just pray one for another this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. And let's just believe God to do great and exciting things for you. If you have a prayer request, you can send it to us this morning by text. And that text will be on your screen uh, throughout the morning. And you can see it. It's 864-777-0156. Uh, that's 864-777-0156. Text us your prayer request so that we can be made aware of those as we begin to pray today and throughout this week. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come into your house this morning in a most different way, but a most unique way. We trust you and we believe you for miracles throughout this nation and around this world. We trust you today, God, because we know that you're in charge and there is nothing too big for you to handle. And we know, Father, that you can cause this virus to just completely disappear. And that's how we pray this morning. It's brought our nation in disruption and it's caused chaos throughout the land. But there's one thing that is for certain. With the child of God, we have peace in our heart that passes understanding and the joy of the Holy Spirit that lives within us to cause us to praise you and to glorify your name through all the things that we face in life. We want to thank you today for keeping your hand upon these precious families who have lost loved ones this past week, upon the Aiken and the Swafford family. We prayed this morning specifically. We pray as well this morning for Kathy Watts and her family and the loss of her sister. And we pray, God, today for her yet to come, all of these families. And we pray, God, today for those that we've read aloud, but there are multiple numbers of people whose names we cannot read aloud or have the time to do so. But, Father, they are just as equally important as others. And I pray that you would bless them today and bring healing to their bodies. Maybe sitting in our homes this morning watching this Facebook Live, this, uh, this uh, service that we're now in, 
Lord, there may be those who just need encouragement. There may be those who just need uplifting by your spirit. There may be those who just need someone just to reach out to them. Well, we do so by the, the internet. But Father, today, we pray that your hand will walk into their home, into their hospital room, into the nursing home, wherever they might be, and that you'll bless them as well. Keep your hand upon our shut-ins this morning, Father, and keep them safe from this virus as well. And we give you praise for what you do and thank you for the opportunity that no matter what happens, we will continue to worship and praise your name. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. And everybody said, Amen. Let me just share a couple of things with you right quick. Tonight at 6 o'clock, our general overseer, Dr. Tim Hill, is going to be having a live telecast from our international offices in Cleveland, Tennessee. This is going to be a wonderful time of celebration. You do not want to miss it. It's called Hope for Tomorrow, and it's tonight at 6 o'clock. Jason Crabb will be there, Bill Gaither will be there, and others, and Sammy Rodriguez will be there preaching, I'm sure. And he's a dynamic minister of the gospel. You can go to facebook.com slash C-O-G-H-Q. H-Q is for headquarters. That's facebook.com slash C-O-G dot or C-O-G-H-Q. And we'll have that slide up on our Facebook page this afternoon, and you may see it momentarily. But we want you to go online tonight at 6 o'clock, and let's worship together with our general overseer and all of those in the executive offices. And uh, don't forget, uh, Wednesday night, we'll be going um, uh, Facebook Live with a Bible study that I'll be presenting to you at 7 o'clock. So join us for that as well. It won't take maybe 35 minutes or so to be with you and share some information with you as well as we go throughout the week. But uh, I look forward to seeing you on Facebook Live this Wednesday night as well. Again, go to facebook.com slash C-O-G-H-Q. And that will help you find hope for tomorrow beginning tonight at 6 p.m. Well, normally at this time we would ask our ushers to come forward, but they're not here either. And so I want you to have the opportunity to give online today through Easy Tie if you'd like to, or MikeTremontCOG.com. Or you can mail it in to 2854 New Easley Highway in Greenville, 29611. Or you can drop it by the church office anytime between 8.30 and 5, Monday through Thursday. We'd love to have you to stop by so we can at least see you if we can't touch you. And uh, just have an opportunity to have fellowship with you briefly. So all of this is so, so important in our days to come that we remain faithful to the Lord. Because the business of the church continues to move on. And so many things are continuing to happen as we... Uh, look to our future and hopefully prepare for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And so a lot of things taking place and um, we just want you to be faithful and you always are. So I thank you. However you choose to give, give to the glory and to the presence of God today. He is so, so, so very good to us. Well, I want to thank those who are here this morning who uh, came in to prepare. They've been here several hours getting ready for this service today that you're watching online. Uh, I want to thank our praise team, Brother Eddie Duncan, our minister of music, and I uh, want to just give thanks to our musicians this morning who are here. But I also want to give uh, thanks to our, our security team that's here, and I want to also give thanks to our media and sound technicians that are here today. They came in early this morning. They've been working tirelessly to get so much ready. There's so much of an undertaking to do what we're doing right now that you might not can imagine. But we're so thankful for them and, and just want to applaud them. So right where you are at home, would you just applaud them and, and tell them thank you. Thank you for what they've done. Now, here's what I want you to do on, on, while you're watching. Just wave at me right now. Wherever you are, just, just wave at me. I, I can't see you, but I can see the guys in the back, but I can't see you at home. And so wave at me and, uh, and share a, a selfie with us or a text while you're watching this morning, even throughout the entire service. You can say praise the Lord, amen, whatever you want to do as we go through this service. But I'm so glad you're here. We're looking forward to a great morning together. Sit back, relax, enjoy some great time of worship. God bless you. If you're looking for somebody you can talk to When the heartache and the trouble overcome you If you're 
There's a man you can count on. You can put your problems on. You got questions. Arms to hold you for all eternity. Look no further, there is no other for a lover, for an understander. Jesus is the answer. You're out there wondering what got this world into such a big old mess. You've been feeling so undeserving of his forgiveness. But there's a key upon the throne lets us know we're not alone you got questions and need direction arms to hold me for eternity look no further there is no other for an anchor, and he's God's right hand. Jesus is the answer. Sometimes life is a no win situation. Get down on your knees, you'll be right there waiting. You got questions, need direction, arms to hold you through eternity. Look no further, there is no other. He's a lover, he's an understander, he's an anchor. And it's God's right hand. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Man, if you have problems or you have things in your life, Jesus is the answer this morning. Had something happen to me this past week that I just want to share with you. Uh, I don't know if you've ever received a text message that was meant to go to someone else, but this past week I did. And my dad spent 12 days in the hospital, a lot of that in intensive care, and uh, went to a rehab facility. We ended up going and picking him up and... Uh, I needed this when it came through. So this was a text message I received. Morning, Kenley. Hope you have a blessed spring day. Praying you and your family is well and safe. Joshua 1-9. Love you. Mrs. Dana of the Beginner's Sunday School class in Oakdale Baptist Church. I replied, wrong number, but thanks. God knew I needed this message too today. So Matt, if you would give me the, the scripture reference she sent me. It says, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you Amen. wherever you go. No matter where you are this morning, as we're on live stream, it's our prayer that he will be your hope. And let's just join together 
I'm going to ask you to sing with your family wherever you may be right now and join in with us as we worship and go into the presence of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. this morning and no matter what you may be going through right now maybe you have needs in your life maybe you're facing a sickness that the doctors can't fix like the coronavirus right now or maybe you have another thing that you're facing in your life we serve a God who is able to meet that need this morning
sing that chorus one more time Thank you, Jesus. because he is our healer this morning he is able to meet any need in our life and I trust in him when I can't fix it myself I trust in our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ because he is able to do anything and everything that you need in your life this morning I want to sing that chorus one more time and I just ask you, wherever you are, just to lift your hands and sing this to him. I believe you're my healer. I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all. Lift your hands, clap your hands to him, and give him praise this morning because he is our healer. Praise your name, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you.
right where you are in your home, wherever you might be this morning. few moments as the word is delivered I want to specifically pray this morning for every first responder every nurse every doctor those that are dear to our hearts in our church and yet father that our hearts go out to all of those who serve their fellow man they are placing themselves in the days past and the days ahead in danger but father they do so with a trust and a heart and a compassion for people and I pray that you will protect them from any harm keep them safe wrap your arms around them and shield them be a buckler unto them father and father we just pray today that you would bless our nation and our president Father, he will be hit on many sides. All of our leaders will. But however those fiery darts may come, give him wisdom, give him understanding. Let him, his ear be attentive to the ones who need to speak to him. And Father, I just pray that you touch his body physically. No one man can stand under the pressure without you like this man is having to stand. So I know he has you, and I know that you're directing every step of his way. So keep him safe, keep him protected, and keep him, Father, whole. I pray this for all of our leaders, Father, today. And I pray, Father, that you will bless your church across denominational lines, no matter where we are or what name is on the marquee of our signs, that we are the body of Christ. And Lord, that you will cause the people of every church to be faithful. Faithful, Lord, in their stewardship of being a light in darkness. Faithful of their tithe and offerings to their church. And faithful, Father, to stand in the midst of adversity and in the day of trouble and declare Jesus Christ is Lord. And I pray, Father, today that you'll continue to bring favor upon your church. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. In 
Jesus' name we pray. And everywhere and everybody said amen. Amen. Now I'm going to take our scripture this morning as I speak on a subject that I had planned to speak on several weeks ago and how fitting it is today. On the church at Smyrna, standing strong in the storm. I preached the first part of this message weeks ago. Today I want to give you the second part of this message, and it's fitting for the hour that we're now in as well. To be strong, be vigilant, take courage. The Lord is with us and always will be till he returns for us again. So if you're in your home or wherever you may be today and have the opportunity and ability to do so right now as we do in this sanctuary in reading the Word of God, would you stand with me, please? And we're going to read together God's Word and we're going to declare His goodness. And to the angel, beginning, or this is Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and not of or the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. For he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. For he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated in your home today. I'm convinced of one very important factor in life is that God loves to use weak people. It's people like you, it's people like me, flawed with imperfection, scarred to many battles physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, that God takes great pleasure in. It is not that he takes the pleasure in our weakness. He just takes the pleasure in the fact that he can bring strength to our weakness. And we, on the other hand, will find every excuse at times to identify and recognize and hold fast to our weakness. We will invent every reason and defend our cause if it might be news to him, but he knows already where we have the struggles in our life, and he knows exactly what needs to be done to correct those things. There will be and are things in our life that we have absolutely no control over, have the ability to change on our own or believe that anyone else can change either. But these are called limitations. They are identified but not a hindrance to making us complete in Him. So how do we approach such limitations? How do we approach things that we have no control of? How can we persevere through things that we cannot touch and handle and correct and make things better? How we approach these limitations with a determined will to get past them in spite of them that is the question of questions for the Christian and we admit that yes we do have weaknesses and yes we do have flaws in our life and we do have imperfections but we one day gave those to Christ and we placed them in his hands and we told him that he would take care of us because we trusted in him and his promises of the word were absolutely sure and certain but be content also with our weaknesses as Paul said that he would be content He boasted about his weaknesses. And while most people seek freedom and release from them, Paul seems to find good points in his weakness, and so should we. He knew that he would be dependent on God to succeed, and he knew that he would have to succeed in order to enjoy life, and he knew that instead of becoming proud with success, he would be reminded that it was not him working out his good, but God, and in all of those things that Paul thought about, it seemed to humble him than make him proud. And the great missionary Hudson Taylor made the statement, all God's giants were weak people. So when you think about that, yes, we are weak in so many ways, but yet we're strong in so many other ways. Be honored to glorify God in your weakness because we are trophies of grace. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says that he understands every weakness of ours. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, he helps us 
in our weakness, the writer says. So here's the truths that we can take home with us today. Just don't get so caught up in your weaknesses that you don't focus on your strengths. And don't get so self-sufficient in your strengths that you forget that it's in the weaknesses that strengths are made strong. I just feel like I just need to say that one more time because that's a mouthful of information. But let me share that with you one more time. Don't get so caught up in the weaknesses that you don't focus on your strengths because it is the strengths of our being and the very strengths of what God has enabled us to do and to be that pulls up the weaknesses in our lives. And don't get so self-sufficient in your strengths as if you can do this all by yourself and that you can stand alone by yourself and forget that it's in weaknesses that strengths are made strong. You might remember Jacob in the book of Genesis. Jacob spent most of his life as a manipulator and running from responsibilities and oftentimes running from situations. One night the Bible tells us that he wrestled with God and he said to God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And God said, that's perfectly fine. He grabbed his thigh and dislocated his hip. And I'm not so sure having hip surgery myself that I want to wrestle with God to that great extent. But it's an important factor to note here that God touched Jacob's strength. That was his hip. The thigh muscle is the strongest muscle in the body, and it turned it into a weakness. He walked with a limp from that time on so he can never be far away from knowing that it is the witness of the Holy Spirit that gives us strength to face this. And it's the joy of the Holy Spirit that gives us a song in our heart so we can sing the song of the redeemed in spite of everything that is going on around us. When I look at the city of Smyrna, what an interesting city that it was. It was the first century of Smyrna that was an amazing city that had overcome such a difficult history. It's about 35 miles north of the city of Ephesus. And it's a prosperous port. It, and the seven of the seven churches in the only city that continually thrives today in Turkey. It has suffered many destructions and rebuildings over the past 20 centuries. In fact, it is called the city that died yet lives. Ironic that one speaking here, Jesus, is the one who was dead and has come to life. Now I want you to know something so very important. The credit of this resurrection of Smyrna after its first destruction belonged entirely to Rome because of Smyrna's historical allegiance and the acceptance of Rome's gods, thus becoming a major site for cultic worship like many other of the cities that we talked about already of the seven churches of Asia Minor. But it was hoped that in Smyrna that it would be a place where the gods would show favor to their faithful worshipers and wall... Uh, all one had to do was to take a grand look at the city from a distance and know that the gods had been pleased by their worship. These great buildings, this adoring cliffs that marked the location of its famous stadium, an infamous library, and many other tourist attractions were in this great city. That's why this panoramic view of Smyrna was called the Crown of Smyrna. This panoramic view was so wonderful that people would come in from the sea and just gaze upon it because of what had transpired there. And although the city was rich in culture, there was a small group of Christians there that lived in adverse conditions, poverty stricken and suffering various forms of affliction. No, John no doubt had reserved a special place in his heart for this great city for, in, for this great church because from the words of Jesus it is said, do not fear any of those things which are, you are about to suffer. In other words, Jesus Jesus gives this church accommodation. Nothing does he have against this church, but he gives them accommodation that they are to rejoice in his presence and not fear because the trouble that is about to come upon them. You see, being a Christian in this city was very difficult. Evidence suggests that life in Smyrna for a faithful Christian was more perilous than anywhere else in the entire Roman Empire. Suffering came initially because the city engulfed itself in emperor worship and competed with many Asian cities to covet the prize of erecting a temple to Tiberius, the emperor. Smyrna won that particular contest. And when the Christians refused to sprinkle incense on the fire which burned before this great monstrous uh, statue, it was dangerous to be a faithful Christian in Smyrna. Hostility began upon them. They began the, to be the focal point and the focus of hostility and persecution in that particular city. 
And I want to share some things with you that I think are important for us to understand. That on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 people who gathered in the upper room and received the presence of God through the breathing of the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. But then several days later, the Bible tells us that this small group of 120 grew to 3,120. And before the st- by the stoning of Stephen, the Bible lets us know that there were an estimating 20,000 believers who were trusting in God and accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. The flame of Pentecost had spread throughout the land and God was doing something great among the people. And about six made it to to Antioch. Why is that? Because after the stoning of Stephen, there was a great dispersion of the people, a, a separation, a scattering of the people of which Peter speaks about in his epistle. That's the ones he is speaking to as he tells us that we're going to come out more precious than gold that perishes because we're faithful to the Lord and we glorify the name of God in the midst of the people. Then you understand that those maybe six or half a dozen came to Antioch and they wanted to establish a church there of a half million people that were living in that city. And by the end of the first century, we know by historical analysis that 20% had come to Jesus Christ. That's 100,000 people had come to know Jesus Christ by the end of the first century in a city of a half a million. Oh, I just want to give you give the Lord great glory and praise today. When I look at the nations of the world today, we have 2.3 billion Christians worldwide today. Been 1.5 billion people attend worship in 5 million worship centers around this world each week. In other words, if you want to lower it a little bit more closely, 174,000 people come to Christ every day. Whenever the world wants to stop us from worshiping God, Whenever Satan unleashes his greatest attack against the people of God and the world itself, God's people will rise up in the last day and declare the glory of God, will declare the witness of God, will declare the holiness of God, and will declare the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, right there in your home, why don't you give the Lord a clap offering of praise? I think about all of this suffering, and I look at the first persecution under Nero who ordered that Rome would be burned. And for nine days the city went up in flames while he sat and he played his harp. And he was quoted saying, he wished to ruin all things before his death. And being found questioned of his conduct, he pointed the finger at Christians. He had some Christians sewn up in wild beast skins and then given to the dogs to be attacked until they died. He placed shirts dipped in wax on some and affixed them to trees in the gardens and set them on fire just to illuminate the night. But that wasn't just the one thing that was happening in the first century. Let's go to the second century and you may be able to see some of these people on the screen. Domitian. Domitian commanded all the lineage of David to be put to death. John boiled in water and exiled to an island called Patmos and set the law that no Christian once brought before the tribunal court should be examined or exempted from punishment without renouncing their religion. Timothy, you might remember Timothy, a bishop in Ephesus and governed the church until the end of the first century. The pagans were about to celebrate a feast and Timothy, meeting with a procession coming down the way, severely reproved them for their ridiculous idolatry and it made the people so mad that they attacked him and beat him with clubs so dreadfully that he died of his bruises too days later. That's what was taking place in the second century. But then let's go on into the third persecution in Ignatius, the one who would follow Peter in leadership of the church. As he passed through Asia, history tells us on his way to death for professing Christ, affirmed to the churches to keep preaching the word of God. And when he had come to Smyrna, oh yes, the city we're talking about this morning, he wrote to the church at Rome, exhorting them that they should not attempt to rescue him. Listen to these words so that they would not deprive him of that which he most longed for he said now I begin to be a disciple I care for nothing visible or invisible so that I may win Christ oh hallelujah let fire and cross let the companies of wild beasts let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs that the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me be it so only that I may win Christ Jesus that's 
that's what this bishop of Smyrna said and at one other martyr a pagan beholding the torture of this great man Ignatius the Bible says or the, the history tells us and the patience of those being afflicted were struck with admiration and made this statement by looking at that which was being done to Ignatius said great is the God of the Christians I want to say it again great is the God of the Christians oh let me say it one more time great is the God of the Christians why is that because the God of the Christians will stand the test of time every single time and the people of God who know him in the fellowship of his suffering as well as in the power of his resurrection then declare today that there is no other God but him and in all of those things he was apprehended this man who declared these words suffering the same fate as those he admired then I want to go to the fourth persecution Many of the persecutions during the time were so severe that even the onlookers had to turn their heads at the horrors that they began to see. Germani uh, Germanicus, a young man who was a true Christian, was delivered to wild beasts on account of his faith and behaved with such courage that several pagans, or several sinners, if you will, became converts to a faith which inspired them to seek. Just leave that picture up for a while. Polycarp. The bishop of Smyrna, hearing that he was being sought, escaped, but was found by a child. And after being taken by the guards, he requested one hour to pray. And he prayed so fervently and so loudly that the guards repented that they had taken him. And standing before his accusers, they asked, would he recant these words? Swear, and I will release thee. Reproach Christ, they said. Polycarp. 86 years, he says, have I served him, and he never once wronged me. But now, how then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And at the stake of which he was tied, and not nailed as usual, assuming them that he would stand immovable, the flame set under his feet to the wood gathered there, surrounded him but never touched him, and the executioner was ordered to pierce him with a sword that when the blood began to flow, it extinguished the fire beneath him. And at his death, Christians desired to give him a decent burial, but they were refused. Oh, God knew exactly where his body would be on that great resurrection day when the dead in Christ shall rise first and all which are remaining shall be caught up to meet them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Many during that time were beheaded. Many were sawed into. Many were burned. Many were delivered to wild beasts and families were killed together for the affirmation of their faith in Jesus Christ. But let this pastor share this with you this morning. Persecution did not stop at the end of the second century. It has never stopped and it never will stop until the day of redemption in fact if you look at history itself Pentecost from 1900 to the present uh, uh, to the 20th century uh, up 19, from the beginning to the 1900 14 million people gave their lives for the sake of the gospel but in the 20th century alone 100 years only 100 years in duration 1900 years in the previous of 14 million but in the 20th century alone 26 million gave their lives as martyrs for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ around this world and every year 100 100,000 people give their lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me break it down a little bit closer. Every single day, every single day in the calendar of 365 days, over 270 people give their lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ around this world. And this message alone, 20 to 30 to 40 people are going to give their lives for the sake of the gospel while we stand here in the most beautiful sanctuary, while you sit in your home and enjoying this worship time. People are giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. Oh yes, we're in terrible times. Yes, we're in perilous times. Yes, we're in difficult times. Yes, we're in persecuted times. But there is is a savior his name is Jesus Christ we hold on to the end we don't give up we don't abandon
abandon the ship and we don't lay down our armor. Why, preacher? Because the end is almost here. And I know that the trumpet is about to sound. And I know Jesus Christ is coming so soon. A church in suffering is a church in praise. So how can a church go through what it did and survive and thrive? Jesus speaks to this church at Smyrna. Again, no accusation made against this church. But he speaks to this church and he says, I know your works and I know your tribulation. I know what you have done for my name's sake. I know the pressures that are upon you. I know the persecution that you have faced. I know the things that have been said evil against you and the things that have been said evil against me, he would say. I understand. I know the works of those who oppose you as well, including Jews who do not choose to receive me. I know your poverty and the slander of those who know better. What's so interesting about that when he says, I know your poverty, but you are rich, he says. <laughs> well, not, they were not rich in money. They were not rich in prestige and position. They were rich in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They falsely accused and abused the worship of the Christians. Some Jews had turned to Christ. Many refused his death and his resurrection. So to better align with their beliefs, aligning with Rome was safer. They could remain in their synagogue and worship their way, these Jews, and please Rome in theirs. And therefore Christ called them a synagogue of Satan. What a terrible stigma could be placed upon any group of people than to be called a synagogue, a dwelling place, a gathering place of Satan. Do not fear any of those things, Jesus said. Your suffering will be for 10 days. Now, many have argued the point. Theologians have discussed it over and over again. I've read quite a number of them. Could mean that there may be 10 emperors of Rome that would succeed the throne. Would that what the 10 days actually means? Could it mean the time that it would take to be accused, tried, or executed once you are condemned or accusations are made against you for being a Christian? Yet not a common practice historically in the city of Smyrna. So that probably is not an option. Could it mean that they would suffer persecution their entire life? What follows is best understood. We don't want to dissect the 10 days as if it means a particular 10 days on our calendar. It's just a period of time. And they would understand that period of time, knowing that even what light ahead and how much further it would be, not understanding and realizing when the persecution would cease, not having any inclination that the clear skies were soon to come, knowing that when the rain is upon us oftentimes and we want the sky to turn blue and clear for the day and the weatherman saying by 3 o'clock this afternoon it should be clear and sunny and we'll have a nice afternoon, we anticipate and expect that it's going to happen. What really unnerves most people today is when 3 o'clock comes and the sun doesn't shine. And so we wait until 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock. And sometimes the weather just halted itself in its movement and didn't do as we suspected it would do. And so we get discouraged about it. All of our plans have been abolished and, and messed up and has to be changed. But there's one thing about this church. No matter what came, no matter what they had to go through, no matter what they had to suffer, no matter what persecution would come, a trial or tribulation or trouble, the Bible said they were to remain faithful unto death. Imprisonment would just not refer to a jail time, but a time when you felt underneath a heavy load, imprisoned and suffocating by oppression of the enemy, and tired of struggling all the time. They would face martyrdom, a death for the belief that they lived every moment of the day. But they had to understand that God would not forget them because they were who they were on purpose. 
I want to say something to us today as I prepare to bring this message to a close. We don't know why what is happening in our nation today is happening. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks down the road, we would have never dreamed that we would be where we are this morning. We would have laughed at someone who would have told us that we would be where we are this morning. But there's one thing that is for certain. The church is going to be resilient. And the church is going to stand. And the church is going to succeed. And the people of God are going to continue to be a witness. We don't know the origin of everything and the reason. We know how Satan brings things upon people. We know disease is not of God. We know God allows certain things at times. We understand that through Scripture. We look at the, at the writer of Job, and we understand his life. And there's so many others, countless others in Scripture. So I don't want to super-spiritualize anything. I don't want to pinpoint any particular instance or activity or something that I could just attach to it. I want to be very careful there. What I do want to do is not cause us to recognize necessarily to bring fear upon us about what is happening. Always work, operate and function in caution and in wisdom. But wisdom comes from the knowledge of his word. That we trust him and realize that God is always going to be with us and God is not going to forget his people. Because they are who they are. We are who we are on purpose. Testing is going to come. But you and I will be able to stand. And an escape is already within our grasp. The escape not be, may not be out of it, but that he will be with us in it and that we will come through it. That's what David said in Psalm 23, in the shadow of death. That's what he said about his oppressors that were coming against him constantly. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not that he is walking in it to stay, but he's walking through it. I will fear no evil. There is a purpose here. Why is the purpose of Smyrna being said and why is Smyrna so chosen out of scripture as one of these seven churches. He said that you might be tried or tested. They would face hostile environments. Everything important to them would be taken away. And to earn a living would be difficult and stressful. That is the meaning of Jesus' words to his disciples in Luke 21. That they will, they will persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogue, into prisons. And it shall turn for you a testimony. It shall turn for you a testimony. To the infant church, Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not just future, but present. That affirms Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The sticks and stones may break our bones, but names can never hurt me, don't necessarily suffice. They will hurt when we experience those things. It will hurt when, when sicknesses and disease come upon us. It will hurt when affliction comes upon us. It will hurt when words pierce our very being. But his words brought them joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. You see, he does not remove them from suffering. Nothing in this scripture denotes that he removed them from suffering, but promises to be with them in suffering and he will bring them out in his time now here's a danger we have to watch for persecution does not come on those who compromise their faith who are not faithful to God in every point of their life who serve God when it's convenient and call on God only when there is a crisis and yield to every other step not ordered by God that he has so gracefully ordered for us Persecution will come to those who stand strong in the standards of the, of, of the word and not the world. And a crown of life, the Bible says, is promised. Smyrna was the crown of existence. It was a city that was crowned with life. But there's coming a day that the child of God is going to be crowned with eternal life. And no more sickness and no more pain and no more heartache and no more trouble. No more persecution, no more trial, no more sickness, no more death, no more tears, but Jesus. My heart today goes out to the multiple of thousands who have contracted this terrible, terrible virus, to their families today, 
We, we pray for you if you're watching us, any of those. But I want to say to the child of God today, to not look upon the things that bring persecution and trial and tribulation to us. Look upon the one who saves us, delivers us, sets us free, and has his hand upon the pulse of his church. The church is alive and well, and it will not, will not vanish away. If by any chance, and I'm very careful, this is a ploy of the enemy to distract us from God's presence. Someone said to me the other day how 9-11 brought multitudes of people into the church until you, you could not hardly put them in the pews. Parking lots were filled. I, I rode by several churches that time. And I saw parking lots filled with people. It's amazing. But that subsided over a few months. And everybody went back to their normal activity because it wasn't the coming of the Lord, they supposed. What's happened today with this virus and what has shook the very foundation of this nation in so many ways is now keeping God's people from his house. But it will not keep God's people from worship. We will worship him. We will glorify him in our homes. We will glorify him if we have to go to work tomorrow. We will glorify him whatever we do. Why? Because our lives belong to him. So whatever comes our way, whatever anyone does who has rule or governance over us, that's okay. Don't fear. Don't let a spirit of fear come upon you. Let that spirit of fear as it's approaching you drive you into your prayer closet. You find refuge there. You find safety there. You find Jesus there. And you stay in that closet until you have the victory and know that you are overcome because he has overcome the world. That is our victory. So today, Claremont Church of God family, many others that are watching us via Facebook Live today, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. But listen, this is not the end. This is not even the beginning. This is just another step to the coming of the Lord and the righteous never being forsaken or his seed begging for bread, David said. We are the people of God. Stand true to that. Pray for one another. This week, get on the phone and call one another and just say, I want to think, was thinking about you. Just wanted to make sure you were okay. Text somebody. Facebook somebody, whatever you do, message somebody, tweet somebody, Instagram somebody, whatever all these things are called. But do it to take care of one member to another member of the body of Christ. And we will overcome. To God be the glory. Great things he is doing. Greater things that are yet to come. So get ready, Tremont. This is just the beginning of getting us ready for the ending. Oh, hallelujah. I feel his presence in this place. And I believe you feel his presence in your home today. I want to pray with you before Pastor Gary comes and gives us final words and dismissal. I want to pray with you. I want you to right now where you're sitting in your home or wherever you are, I want you to stretch your hand this way. And I want you to believe God with me. I want us to trust the Lord together. Oh, how I wish I could see you this morning. Oh, how I wish I could hug your neck and shake your hand and greet you and love on you. Oh, how I wish I could do that. You just don't know how my heart hurts today. And I've been troubled in my spirit all week long. But I know God. Go out there in your home, stretch your hands. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my church family. As they stretch their hands toward their device that they're watching us on this morning, I stretch forth my hand unto them. And I pray favor and blessing and protection upon them. I pray, Lord, that you'll keep them safe and unharmed of this virus. I pray, God, that you will keep their families safe and unharmed of this virus. And I pray, God, you'll give them victory. I pray for every job that it will be held safe. 
I pray for every financial need of every member and attendee of our church. I pray, God, that right now you'll supply the need in ways that they will never imagine it to be supplied, but that you'll take care of the needs of your people. I pray, God, not only for my family of Tremont, but I pray for every family around this world. And I pray, God, that you would lay your hand upon them. Those who are suffering under this virus right now, that you will raise them up and heal them. Let not the enemy or anything get glory, but you get glory, Father. May the presence of the Lord reign in our lives every day of our lives as we seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, Lord, take us from this morning worship today. And Lord, keep us safe. Keep your love near us. Keep your spirit abiding in us. And keep the song in our heart by the joy of the Holy Spirit as we sing it every day. Know, God, that you will bring favor and blessing upon those who will stand in the day of testing. And you will give us the victory. You promised that in your word. And I thank you for it. And I pray for every church right now, regardless of what name is on the marquee, I pray for every single church in our nation today and even around this world. Some, Father, actually live week to week. Some, Father, actually function from Sunday to Sunday to pay their bills. I know that. I know many who are like that. I pray, Father, right now you will give them out of nowhere, even out of someone who doesn't know you, who doesn't profess to know you, to come to their door and knock on their door and give them a financial gift to bless their church. I pray that prayer right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray victory over every church that professes Jesus Christ as Lord and lives according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you for answered prayer. Amen, amen, and amen. Know this one thing, your pastor sure does love you, and I'll see you soon. As we do so many times here at the Tremont Church, right where you are, there in the living room or wherever you may be, let's give God praise, amen. Let's just give Him all the praise and glory. Such a timely message. want to remind you, Wednesday night at 7 p.m., the pastor will be online again with a Bible study, so be sure to tune in this coming Wednesday night. Also, for the youth and the uh, college and the children, we will be in touch with you about uh, Bible study throughout the week. So uh, let us just pray and ask God's blessing on this day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this word. God, may each and every one today, may they experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May they know that God loves them, and may they walk in the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. God, may they have a great day, and may they have an awesome week in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. Thank you for watching today. God bless you. Have a great day. The king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life. Oh, he's my son. Yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good.
never gonna 